It doesn't, doesn't happen that way. So uh, we're going to do a little review. and We're going to back up a long way, but I'm going to move very fast. Um, I'm not going to, I'm, I'm just going to skim over a few things. So we've been talking about miracles, signs, and wonders, but we've moved in the last, uh, last week to talking about the ascension. You'll get to understanding why we're talking about the ascension again in just a few minutes as we review some. But do you have your Bibles? Yes, sir. All right, Acts chapter 5 and verse 12 says, and by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people. At the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people. Now jump down to verse 20. Verse 20, they've been arrested, right? In verse 20, the angel sets them free and says to them, Go, stand, and speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life. And so we've asked the question, what life? What does that mean? All the words of this life. What life? Well, I know the, the, the pat or off-the-cuff answer would be, well, Jesus' life. But that's not the correct answer. The life that it's referring to is resurrection life. It's not talking about Jesus before death. It's talking about life of Jesus after death. Are you with me? So... It was because they preached the resurrection that they kept getting arrested. Uh, why? Because it messed with religion's doctrine. It messed with their sacred cows and, and all of that kind of stuff. It was alive. It was moving. It was doing things that they could not do. It was doing things that they could not do. And so, what's that? Or control. They couldn't control it. And so that kind of makes the, the religious authority, it makes them mad. It makes them mad. So anyway, so uh, we, we also looked at verse 28 of uh, Acts, tra- Acts chapter 5, verse 28. So they've been arrested. They've been commanded to do certain things. And this is another one of the commands from the religious authorities saying, Did we not straightly command you that you should not teach in this name? And behold, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. So we ask the question, what doctrine? Well, let's look over. We looked at a couple different places in the, within the first five chapters of Acts, but today, real quick, look at Acts chapter 2. If you have your Bibles, you're right there in Acts, and so it's pretty easy. Just flip over a couple pages. Acts chapter 2 and verse 22. This is Peter. He stands up on the day of Pentecost. By the way, this Sunday coming up is Pentecost Sunday. We are right on schedule. Acts chapter 2 and verse 22, Peter's standing up. He's preaching. Uh, Remember, we already read the verses before. It says, I will show wonders in the heavens and signs in the earth beneath blood and fire and vapor of smoke. But verse 22, ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, As ye yourselves know, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God have ye taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Next verse 24 and then we'll skip a bunch. Whom God had raised up having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be holden of it or that death could hold him or that he would hold death uh, but really that death could hold him. So that's Acts 2, 22 through 24. Jump uh, 10, well, 8 verses, verse 32. This Jesus, this is Peter still preaching here. This Jesus has God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this, which ye now see and hear. Now, this is important for where we will be going in a few minutes after we review. That's why I specifically use this portion to talk about what doctrine. What doctrine? Well, Jesus lived. He performed miracles. Jesus died. More specifically, he was crucified. He was buried. He rose from the dead. And he ascended on high. That is the doctrine that these apostles were preaching. That is the doctrines that got them in trouble. That is the doctrines that caused lame men to walk. 
Those are the teachings, those are the doctrines that caused blind people to see. Those are the doctrines that caused shadows to heal sick people. That's the system of belief that wrought miracles, signs, and wonders at the hands of the apostles. You say, well, Jesus did all those things. Well, yeah, the apostles did all those things. How did the apostles do all those things? Well, we'll get there. Now, you're in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 4 and verse 33. We've read these verses already. We're just touching them again. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Uh, Nope. I'm sorry, that was verse 32 that I was reading. Verse 33, and with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. So the proof of the resurrection, the proof that Jesus was alive, was no longer the physical body of Jesus. Are you with me? You guys are... Looking rather intently. I receive best with a smile myself. (laughs) You know, every time I eat good food, it always puts a smile on my face. Yeah. Yeah, I wonder why in church so many times we get so so serious and we have a, a frown rather than receiving with joy. I'm not saying you're not receiving with joy. I'm just saying you don't look like it. Anyway. So, with great power gave the apostles witness. The same miracle signs and wonders took place by the hands of the apostles. Okay, so here's the next question. How is it that the apostles could carry resurrection power? Nobody argues. Well, there's a lot of people that argue that Jesus didn't raise from the dead. They just flat wrong. History proves it. You don't don't even need the Bible to prove that Jesus rose from the dead. You can go look at an encyclopedia and find out that Jesus rose from the dead. I saw this thing on Facebook the other day. It was pretty cool. I won't be able to quote it exactly, but it was a little video that basically said all these other religions came because somebody claimed that they had a divine revelation or a divine encounter. Uh, Yeah, that somebody, an individual claimed that they had a a, uh, divine encounter and nobody else was around to view it or see it. So therefore, that divine revelation or that divine encounter would be what we call private. It was just them and whatever being. And so they go out and populate their story and get other people to believe. But Jesus, nothing about him was private. Nothing about him was private. Entirely public. Entirely public. All the prophecies even before his life were public. Yeah. Angels announced him. I mean, you know, multitudes of angels over fields of shepherds. And we always just assume three shepherds. But there's no indication of that. It could have been a hundred shepherds out there. We don't know. Anyway, public, 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 public crucifixion and public teachings, public crucifixion, public resurrection. And then after he's he's uh, risen, he shows himself publicly through many infallible proofs, even to his disciples. Uh, And then even after he ascends, he ascends. Well, that's, that's what we're talking about today. But he ascends publicly. And then his disciples go out and in his name, in his authority, in his power, do public works. And it's still happening today publicly. Amen. That's right. True. Yeah. I don't think he's here. Oh, he is here. Look at there. Hey, Mr. Burns, how you doing? His name is Kaiser. Yeah. Okay, so how is it that the apostles could carry resurrection power? Or this question. How is it that resurrection power could be in us? How is it that resurrection power could be in us? Well, here's where we picked up last week. So you have your Bibles. Turn to John chapter 14. We won't read as much as we did last week. We read a lot. We read John chapter 14. We read John chapter 5. We read all sorts of stuff last week. We're just going to hit the highlights today. John chapter 14 and verse 12. Jesus says, Verily, verily, I say unto you. First of all, he could have just said, I say unto you, and it would have been true. But then he says, Truthfully, I say unto you. But then on top of that, he says, truthfully, truthfully, I say to you. So three times he spoke truth. Two times he said it was true. And one, he just spoke it. Okay. Mom. Mom, relax. <laughs> verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believes on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. Do you believe that? Yes. 
Well, we said last week there's one caveat there. What is the caveat? What's the prerequisite? What's the requirement? Believe. Believe. He that believes on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do. And he tells us why. Because I go unto my Father. Because I go unto my Father. Well, what happened when he went unto the Father? Well, that's true, and that's what we'll talk about today. He sent us the Holy Ghost, but did you know that there are two ascensions? True. We discussed one of them last week, and I didn't point out to you as to which ascension it was, but it was the first. So turn with me if you would. We'll, we'll take a little more time to, to clarify that here. To John chapter 20. You're in John chapter 14 right now, so just flip a few pages over to John chapter 20. Jesus is crucified. He's buried. Three days later, he raises up from the grave. Mary speaks to him at the tomb, and in verse 17, John chapter 20 and verse 17, he says to her, Touch me not. Don't touch me. For I am not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father and to my God and to your God. And then a few days later, in verses 26 and 27, he shows up to him. And what does he say? Reach hither thy finger. He probably didn't say that. He said, touch me. Right here. Verse 26, and after eight days, again, his disciples were within and Thomas was with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut and stood in the midst and said, peace be unto you. Verse 27, then saith he to Thomas, reach hither thy finger and behold my hands, reach hither thy hand and thrust it into my side and be not faithless, but believing. So what happened during that time period in ascension number one? This is what we discussed last week. In ascension number one, Jesus made it possible for us to be born again. He made it possible for us to be born again. More than just having our sins forgiven. Did you know there is a difference between having your sins forgiven and being born again? True. There is a difference between having your sins forgiven and being born again. The Old Testament saints could have their sins forgiven, not counted against them. The blood of bulls and goats, it was counted against that bull. It was counted against that goat. He's the one that paid the price. He's the one that paid the penalty. Well, you had to do that over and 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 over again. Not for the same sin, but for the next sin. You know they didn't have to offer a sacrifice for a sin that they already offered a sacrifice for? If they obeyed that law by faith, then the sin was covered. They didn't have to offer the sacrifice again. True. So that's where we find out in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 6. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 6. Now when these things were thus ordained, the priest went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. We're going to go all the way to verse 14. Verse 7, but into the second went the high priest alone once a year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. The Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing. When we get to verses 11 and 12, that's the big part. Which was a figure for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices, not that could make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. Verse 10, which stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. Now here we go. But Christ being come a high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, verse 12, neither by the blood of goats and of calves, but by his own blood. He entered in once. Somebody made reference once and for all. Yes. He entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us, blood does not have to be sacrificed for sin any longer. Why? Because Jesus presented his blood to the Father in heaven. Ascension number one. Ascension number one. Now, you probably you must not have realized that there were two ascensions, but there are two ascensions. 
And in one, he made it possible for us to become the sons of God. Now, if you're going to be a son, you need to be anointed. If you're going to be a son, that makes you a potential candidate for the Holy Ghost. So in ascension number two, in ascension number two, which we'll discuss now, he gave us the Holy Spirit. You guys with me tonight? Yes. All right. Let's go back to John chapter 14. John chapter 14 and verse 8. Now we'll come right back to John chapter 14 and verse 12, which is where we started just a few minutes ago. But John chapter 14 and verse 8. Philip said unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it suffices us. Verse 9, Jesus said unto him, Have I been so long a time with you, and yet ye have not known me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the Father. How sayest then, show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwells in me, he does the works. Now we've read this verse before when we're talking about miracles, signs, and wonders. And we said, how did Jesus do them? Well, Jesus recognized that he of him own, his own self couldn't do anything. Amen? Amen? And I asked you the question last week with the statement that says many people have taught that Jesus did mighty works because he was the son of God. And that idea that Jesus did mighty works because he was the son of God is both wrong and right. Now, we've usually always only looked at that as being that he was wrong or that that statement is wrong. He didn't do things because he was the son of God. Well, that presents a challenge because the next question is, well, then how can you do those things? Because if he did them as a man, couldn't anybody do them as a man? So he didn't do them as a man. He did them as a man anointed of God. He didn't do mighty works as a man. He did mighty works as a man anointed of God. Are you with me? That changes some of our thinking. We've always only approached that as saying he did them as man, not as God. Well, that's only partly true to say that. He didn't do them as God. Why? Because he laid aside his royal robes of deity. We understand that. Everybody here understands that. We've been taught that for, for years. But he didn't do them as a man. Because otherwise, why can't any man do that? Right. Any, man can't do it. any man can't do it. It's not within the power of mankind to do wonders to do miracles, to do signs. It's not within man's power to do miracles, signs, and wonders. But it is within God's power to do miracles, signs, and wonders. Well, but you just said Jesus didn't do miracles, signs, and wonders because he was God. He didn't do them because he was God. He did them because he was the Son of God, anointed of God. And Jesus, with his blood, made it possible for you and I to be sons of God. We covered the verses last week. You can go back and, and listen to that. Um, where did we leave off? Chapter 14.10. 14, 10. John 14.10. 14, in verse 11. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me. Or else believe me for the very work's sake. So Jesus wasn't in himself. He was in the Father. He said in the previous verse, the Father that dwells in me he does the works. Verse 12, we've already read it. Verily, verily, I send to you, he that believes on me, the works that I do, shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go to my Father. Now, jump down to verse 16, please. And I will pray the Father, and he, who? The Father. The Father. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you, Forever, Jesus, as a man, would not be able to abide with us forever. But the Holy Ghost can. Verse 17, even the spirit of truth, 
whom the world cannot receive, because it sees him not, neither knows him. But ye know him, for he dwells with you and shall be in you. So Jesus is promising the Holy Ghost to the disciples. He's promising the Holy Ghost. Now, a little time later, actually, it began, the process began that night. It was later that night that Judas uh, betrays him. And the soldiers take Jesus and they take him away and then the trials begin and all. Okay, so Jesus is crucified. Jesus, is ra- Jesus raises from the dead. He sees Mary. He says, don't touch me. He ascends. But when he comes back, he had not yet sent the Holy Ghost. So when does the Holy Ghost come? Well, the Holy Ghost comes after the second ascension. Turn all the way back to the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 28, the last chapter of Matthew. And so what we're about to look at is very familiar stuff. Most people refer to it as the Great Commission. So I want to look at that with you in four different books. We're going to look at it in Matthew. We're going to look at it in Mark. We're going to look at it in Luke. And we're going to look at it in Acts. If you look at it in John, it's very scattered and it's very difficult um, to, to follow it there. So we won't look in John, but we'll look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and Acts. Matthew chapter 28 and verse oh, 16. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into the mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Did you realize that some of the disciples doubted? Hmm. And Jesus came and spoke unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo... I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Well, that's kind of strange because he's just about to leave. He says, I'm with you always, and then he's just about to leave. They don't know that yet, though. Do you realize that? They don't know that he's about to float away. Flip over to chapter uh, 16 of Mark. Mark chapter 16. And verse 14. Same occasion, different perspective. Afterward, he appeared unto the eleven. Jesus appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat, as they sat to eat. And abraded them with their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. In other words, he had to show them them himself. You couldn't believe somebody's testimony. I had to come and just show show you myself I'm right and say touch me where'd I leave 15 and he said unto them go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature he that believes and is baptized shall be saved but he that believes not shall be damned and these signs shall follow them that believe In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. And we'll pick up the next two verses in just a moment. How many of you heard that passage before? And you've probably asked these questions. What's the requirement there? I asked the question earlier. Same answer. What's the requirement in the Great Commission? To believe. To believe. And these signs shall follow... Them that doubt. No. No. These signs shall follow them that decided not to believe. No. Signs don't follow anybody who don't believe. Why? Because it's not within the power of man to have signs. It's not within the power of man to have signs and wonders and miracles. But it is within the power of God. Verse 19. So then... After the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven. There he goes. And sat on the right hand of God. Now we read it earlier where Peter is preaching on the day of Pentecost, which is uh, would be ten days, ten days after this. Ten days after this ascension. Uh, 
and, and, and he preaches to them that he ascended and sits at the right hand of God. Okay, anyway, so then after the Lord has, that was in Acts chapter 2, we read it earlier. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat at the right hand of God, and they went forth. Who? The believers. The believers. The believers. I would venture to say it was not all the disciples. But it was only those that believed from that point that didn't fall away. Those that decided to believe. How do we know that? Because it's not within the power of man to have miracle signs and wonders. And as you go into the book of Acts, you find out that miracle signs and wonders followed the apostles. So the apostles that went and did what Jesus commanded, they went forth and preached everywhere. Those are the ones that believed. How do we know they believed? Because they obeyed the command. We know they believed because they obeyed. We know they believed because they obeyed. We, didn't, we don't know that they believed because they had it up in their head or even had it in their heart. We know they believed because they had it in their feet. We know they believed because they had it in their hands. We know they believed because they had it in their words. The proof of believing is not in the head and it's not in the heart. But it's in the hands and in the feet and in your mouth. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with. Now, I know your Bible and my Bible and the screen says the Lord working with them. But in the, uh, in the, in the Greek, the word them is not there. The word them is inserted in there because it's understood that they went forth. But I want to just bring your mind to this. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with. What did they preach The resurrection, that he lived, that he died, that he, was, that he was crucified, that he was buried, that he rose. They preached the resurrection. Everybody saw the death. Not everybody saw the resurrection. A bunch of them did. A bunch of them did. But they preached the resurrection. They preached the ascension. They preached the words of this life, the resurrection life, and it was proven, their words was proven the same way Jesus was proven. We read it earlier. A man approved of God by miracles, signs, and wonders. The apostles were therefore approved of God their words were approved of God. How? By miracles, signs, and wonders. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with. Working with what? Well, working with them, but working with what they preached. Working with the word that they declared. And confirming the word with signs following. So the word that they preached was confirmed. How? How? Not through, oh yeah, I heard somebody else say that. But no, through miracles, signs, and wonders. It was the proof that Jesus was still alive. But he's not on earth. Well, who is he alive in? He's alive in those apostles. Of which I am now one. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Everybody, all Suzaman, that means all together. That's me. Are you born again? Yes, me. Are you born again? Yes, me. Does the Spirit of God reside in you? Yes, me. yes sir. Yes. Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24 and verse 36. And as they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said unto them, Peace be unto you. And they were terrified and frightened, and supposed that they had seen a spirit. And he said unto them, Why are you troubled? And why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I, myself, handle me, and see. For a spirit has not flesh and bones, as you see me have. Remember we talked about Hebrews chapter 9? Did you notice what Jesus said here? He's already gone up to be with the Father for the first ascension. Now he's back talking to his disciples. And he says to them, A spirit has not flesh 
and bones as you see me have. Well, what about blood? What about the blood? He left the blood. He poured out the blood. Y'all need to get saved. That's so cool. He had a glorified body. He poured out the blood. He didn't need the blood anymore. He didn't need the earthly blood anymore. So he comes back. All right, where did I leave off? 39. Behold my hands and feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see me, for a spirit had not flesh and bones as you see me have. All right. We'll skip on over, please, to uh, verse 46. And he said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among the nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things, and behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. And he led them out as far as Beth Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And it came to pass, while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned into Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Now, where it says there that he blessed them, you can look over in the book of John uh, and you'll find out some things that he blessed them with. And one of the things that he did is he breathed on them and he says, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Let's look over in Acts chapter 1. I've only got a couple minutes here until uh, everybody turns into a pumpkin. Acts chapter 1 and verse 2, until the day that which was, he was taken up. So we just read the occasions where Jesus was taken up. So this is the same occasion. Um, well, verse 1, a former treatise I have made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach until the day in which he was taken up. After that, he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen. Now, you know the story. But he tells them, wait for the promise of the Father. Verse 4, you have heard of me. That was back in John chapter 14. We read just a little bit of it. John chapter 14, John chapter 15. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not too many days from now. John baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not too many days hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? Verse 7, And he said unto them, It's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. I want to tell you something. Jesus did not say, it's not for you to know times and seasons. He said, it's not for you to know times and seasons that the Father has put into his own power. There are times and seasons for us to know. There are other times and seasons that are not for us to know. So don't ever let anybody take that and say, well, you don't know the times. We don't know the seasons. Those are in the Father's power. No, there are some times and seasons that it is within our power to know. There are other times and seasons that it's not within our power to know. Verse 8, but I like how he just brings them right back to focus, right back to what Jesus was trying to help them to see in his last days on earth. You shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and in under the uttermost parts of the earth. Now I have a lot more to go, but I don't have enough time. But I just want to focus on the word witnesses. And I know most of the time we focus on the word martyr because it's the same Greek word. But we read, and with great power gave the apostles witness. Acts 4.33. We read it earlier. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and ye shall be witnesses unto me and with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and when we come back next week we'll talk about when Jesus ascended what descended where it was prophesied and what it reminds us of in the in the living life rather than just Jesus saying so but I don't have time let's pray father 
I thank you for your word. And Lord, I thank you for these people. And I pray that you infuse them with power from on high. That we get our mind off of the things of this world. That we keep our mind off of the things of this world and that we keep our mind on the things of heaven. That we are keenly aware that we're not here for ourselves, but we're here for you. We're not here for our glory, but we're here for your glory. We're not here for our kingdom, but we're here for your kingdom. We're not here for our purpose, but we're here for your purpose. And I thank you that you infuse us with the power of the Holy Ghost. Resurrection life. For the same spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead, it dwells in us. And it quickens our mortal bodies. So we thank you for resurrection life that flows in us and through us by your spirit. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. If you need prayer this evening, I'll be down here happy to minister to you. A variety of others could pray with you too. You could probably just turn to the person next to you and say, Hey, I need prayer. I got this pain. I got this ailment. I got this sickness or whatever. Run it off. They got the same power of the Holy Ghost that I do, that you do, that we all do. Can you smile at me? There you go, Shannon. Say it. That's me. All right, maybe not. Good night. <laughs>